of engagement in antiquity usually did not have you fighting in winter. If the ground is mush, you can't get chariots, you can't get wagons through it. You wait usually until the dry seasons. Intriguing, even in Mesopotamia, the planet Venus, which marked the seasons when spring comes, the name of Venus for the Mesopotamians was Inanna in Sumeria and then Ishtar. That's our word today for star. It's a 5,000 year old word, Ishtar. Same word for star, it becomes Aster in Greek. Anyway, that was the signal. When Venus rose, it was the signal to go to war. So Ishtar was the goddess of love and the goddess of war. You know, the hormones rise in spring, the sap rises, and the ground dries out, so you can go to war. So uh, here you have Hannibal, who changes the rules of engagement. He always has a smaller army. He has, he has uh, the, the audacity to fight in winter, to fight at night, to use as his secret weapon nature. Terrain, topography. So I also teach at the U.S. Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island. And in a room like this, I see four different colored uniforms, so Army, Navy, Marines, Air Force. And then in the same room, you have people with name tags and little tags in front of their desk. And it's NSA, CIA, FBI. Everybody wants to understand Hannibal's tactics. His use of that Spanish silver paid for the best military information the best military intelligence in antiquity. He may not have been the founder of spycraft, but boy, did he use that information wisely. Well, I'll, I'll get to a little bit of that. Uh, please, if you have questions, even now, this isn't a spiel. You can, we can stop at any point. Yes, ma'am. So by using topography, would yes. you do ambush? Oh, yes. Ambush is a critical weapon. And not just ambush, surprise. So he always got there first to a battle site, and he sussed out the terrain, the topography. He chose the conditions that would favor his surprise tactics. And, and we'll see this, if you want to see, if we can actually, if I can uh, maybe get to that. And I'm, I'm, I'm my own worst enemy with time. Uh, that's Carthage, where Hannibal grew up. That's a picture I took, and that's the mountain of Baal, where Hannibal may have sworn that vow, if it's a true story who is God Baal. And think about his name, Hannibal in Phoenician. It means Baal's favorite. Baal, Hana. Okay, Hannibal. So uh, there's the Gulf of Tunis. Of course, Rome superimposed its own culture on top of the Punic city. But way down here, you see the secret harbor, the Clothon. And in that harbor, that's what it looks like uh, now. That's what it looked like then. I was walking along here, thanks to National Geographic. Now I see Mark. Okay, Mark, thank you for letting me come. It's great to see you again. Uh, and Chris. Now, I was walking on the sand, right basically there. I'm left handed, so I better use my left. There we go. I was walking right there, and I kicked up in the sand. What is that? This shell. It was a murex shell. The monopoly Carthage had on purple dye had been sitting there for 2,500 years, or at least 2,200 years. And I picked it up. That was one of the trade monopolies that made Carthage so great when they ruled the seas. And there it was. I still have it. I may even have it with me today. I'll pass it around if you're interested in seeing a little relic of history. I think history should be tangible. So Carthage's wonderful monopolies in frankincense, Egyptian luxury goods, purple dye from that little shell. It was legendary. Uh, and the military harbor protected the commercial harbor. So the military harbor out here, commercial harbor here. And you can see that, as I said from my photo here too. Now, the three great battles where Hannibal used nature, the environment, as his weapon. Trebia, Trasimene, and Cannae. And boy, did he teach the Romans some lessons. Now, I'm not against Rome, but Hannibal, in a way, it was very important for Rome to become the formative state that it was. The Roman Empire would not have happened had Hannibal not taught them some lessons. And that's a point in history. We don't hear enough from Romanists. 
Uh, and why, why, I mean, if you think about it, so I'd worked in Phoenician sites in Lebanon, in Israel. I'd worked in Celtic hill forts. I'd worked in Roman sites, Roman roofs, and Harold pulls it all together. Phoenicians, Celts, Romans. And every time we were doing our road survey at Stanford with all these great students, a lot of engineers who are also football players, that's actually the case. Uh, and we talked to the locals. Now, from Slovenia and Austria through Switzerland, France, Italy, we come through all these countries, and every time we were surveying a Roman road in these countries, this was even before our Hannibal project started, villagers said, oh, yes, Hannibal came through our village. Well, every village said that across five, you know, four or five countries. That couldn't be true. So that was one of our formative moments. Let's find out. Let's see if we can track it. But the secret weapon that I'm going to try to get there. This guy brought an elephant over the Alps in 1935. Does he look like he has been riding that elephant a long time? I think he just, he's in a suit. He just got on. <laughs> That's in the Grand Severn Pass where we worked for 10 years. But Hamilton didn't go over the Grand Severn Pass. It's too far to the north and too far to the east. So friends of mine brought an elephant in 1959. They said, wouldn't it be neat to bring an elephant over the Alps? Where are we getting an elephant? So they asked around, and the Torino Zoo had a rambunctious adolescent elephant the zookeeper wanted to get rid of for the summer. So Alberto said to John and Richard, said, you can take my elephant. Please take my elephant. She, she needs some exercise. Get her out of Torino. Also, they said, okay, we've got elephants, but this could be tricky. Let's get this underwritten. Guess who underwrote them? Lloyds of London gave the insurance. But then the RSPCA got on their backs. You're going to shred that poor elephant's feet on the rocks. So they had huge leather boots made, <laughs> about four inches thick. This was great. And this elephant was so smart, as all elephants are. And I've had to work with the San Diego Zoo. I've had to work with uh, pachyderm vertebrate zoologists, Smithsonian. You learn a bit about elephants, and then Susie, of course, what well, Susie. But here's Jumbo. Oh, right. There's Jumbo. Yes. No, elephants can't ski. Too high a center of gravity. If they roll, look out. Get out of the way. Sorry, Babar. I was just there uh, by that, by the, you know, you know, many of you know the Badoots and some rights. Anyway, that's Jumbo. Can you, and you, you may not tell yet that she's Asian, uh, but you'll see it soon. The British Alpine Expedition from Cambridge University, John Hoyt, Richard Jolly, two engineers, they get this elephant. They get Lloyds of London to underwrite it. Uh, they've got the big boots that you probably don't see in this picture. And the elephant just loved people, loved to hike, uh, just swing in her trunk back and forth uh, at about four miles an hour, and maybe even more when she was really excited. And here she is running along. <laughs> she looks happy, doesn't she? She's so happy to be in the picture. But when they camped at night, Jumbo and the people, John, Richard, and their teams, they would sit down by the campfire and sing with their guitars, Kumbaya, and she droned along. She sang, and she loved it. Well, they did go over the Alps. And National Graphic has asked me on many occasions, would you like to take an elf over the Alps? I'm sure we can find you one. And I said, well, I'm not sure the uh, SPCA and PETA, my good friends in PETA, uh, we, we have a friend named Alicia Silverstone, uh, and she would not let me take an elephant over the house. Right? So, anyway. But I did manage to bring some elephants over the house, and I'll get back to that. Okay. So, what's the difference? What do you see? Even smaller. So, we know this picture isn't contextualized for scale, but Asian elephants are two to three feet smaller than African. The uh, Asians have a little grayer skin tone. The average is a little more tan. But look at the ears. You see the difference? Which have the big ears? Africans. And which have trunks? Now, Asian females 
don't have, so they all have trophies, which don't have tusks. The Asian females don't have tusks. In Asia, the Mahabharata, the Bhagavad Gita, you read about these great famous histories of war elephants. Alexander brought some back to Babylon, and then his, his successors brought them back to uh, Seleucia, the Seleucids, Antioch. They, they raised Asian elephants, and if you read the book of 1st Maccabees, you'll see war elephants from India with trainers called Indioi from India. So we know there are Asian elephants. Hannibal rode an elephant through the Apennine marshes and the, the Arno River marshes. The, his favorite elephant, he was called the one-eyed Getchman because he lost his eye in the marshes, and Hannibal did. His elephant was called Suros, the Syrian, which was an Asian elephant. One, though, if you look, look at the backs. Asian elephants' backs have an upward curved spine. African elephants have a saddle. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, the Elephus maximus, the Asian elephant, of which there are about three or four sub-varieties, including Java, Sri Lanka, and so on, uh, and the African elephant, Loxodendron africanus, there's a now extinct version called the Atlas Mountain elephant, which was Loxodendron africanus atlanensis, gone, extinct now. But take a look at this coin that I showed you. Now, close up. It's clearly what kind of elephant on this coin. African. It corroborates. The coin, of course, was there all along from the Mogo Board Division exam. But Susie also proved to us that African elephants can be easily taken to war. Maybe reluctantly trained to charge, but they're like big tanks with their tusks out, and they trample and gore. They've been trained for so many thousand years to do that. So now, very quickly, that's just an astrographic textbook, and it shows me reading a geological map because it's an archaeologist. If you don't study the geomorphology, if you don't study the terrain, if you don't know the erosion rates, if you don't know the stone weathering, if you don't know how long it takes soil to form, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that's soil science, pedology, pH soil chemistry. You have to be a scientist, too. And uh, that place, that valley I'm laying down on reading that geological map, that's a summit camp because the Italian border at the top of the house is right there. You see it behind you? That's the border. And we know Hannibal camped at the summit. Now, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's quite an intrepid march, it, although it's a gradual 4,000 foot climb per diem. And we go up and down every day 4,000 feet. Sometimes we camp there. Uh, right now, it's under snow. Here's a day we cycled. We've cycled the entire route from Avignon, the ancient fording place. We cycled all the way to the top of the Alps. Now, not obviously all in one go. <laughs> Every year we did a different segment. Now, the adults here, uh, I think I'm allowed to say that that day when you cycle from Avignon across the Rhone River through Orange up to Pont Saint Esprit, guess what village you cycle through? Chateauneuf du Pape. Uh, 37 bottles of Chateauneuf du Pape went on the bicycles that day. And other than just tasting the wine at the wineries, the students were a little frustrated. That wine went to our sponsors, that wine went to all of them. Uh, but anyway, so one of the side perks. All right, now, you have football players, basketball players, crews, you name it, all kinds of good athletes. And we put the best bicyclist as sweep at the back. He didn't like that. But you've got to be sweep. Somebody, your most experienced person has to be the tail, not the front. Anyway, great kid. Uh, we're looking at geological maps. Um, and uh, gorgeous terrain. Five minutes. Five minutes. Five minutes. Thank you, Chris. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just amp this up now. Does this look like a place you want to go? Please think about it. We take students from every place we can. I've taken five year olds, I've taken 85 year olds. But I'm going to make sure that their legs don't collapse on them. Now, those two guys, quarterbacks, engineers, 6'6", six, 6'4". Six, six, One of my drivers decided to not listen to drive a U-turn, which meant he went into the soft shoulder of the road, sunk in the mud. These two guys lifted the car. <laughs> and they're engineers. 
uh, the UC Davis quarterback and the Stanford quarterback. That's the terrain, that's the camp we think how we're camped at. You see all the green grass down there in the lake? Elephants can easily survive with that kind of material. Too high and they can't. Too low and there's no snow. They have to have snow because Polybius says they broke through the fresh of crushed snow and hit the icy snow from the year before. So it sets the height of the pass, not too high, not too low. All right, very quickly. What do, what do the students do when they see a snow patch there? Well, I get hit with a lot of snowballs, <laughs> but that's okay. You can see Torino from there. I told you I take some big people, Stanford O-line, George Holloman Doris, 6'10", 300 pounds. Remember what I said about getting around this problem of, of, of certain need? Joel Blay, our favorite guy in the world, when he saw Stanford football players trying to come out of a van, you know, they have to back out, they're so big. Patrick, vous prenez les éléphants. <laughs> Those are my elephants. Okay. Great guy. And George, an engineer at Boeing. So I probably should stop. Uh, the first time we did this, in a blizzard. The wind was so bad, 100 kilometers an hour, it shredded our clothes. If you look closely, we're duct taped together. If you look at our pants. The fog is sometimes so thick you can't see 10 feet. One day, hiking, the students were a little worried about that. I'm glad they didn't see the cliff we were on. But, 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 we heard a flock of sheep go by. Didn't see it one. We, we saw the plops where they had walked. We sat down for lunch, the fog rose 10 feet. Oh look, some students said, look at that big shaggy silhouette of the sheepdog. <laughs> it was a wolf following the sheep. And we see them up there quite a bit. And we've dug up bones with huge canine puncture marks in the brachia. Human brachia. Oh. Maybe animals, people. Who All right, I should stop here, but I want I just got to show you secret weapon. Look, this is what Hannibal made the Romans cross on the winter solstice. He used nature as a weapon. They crossed the river because he taunted their army to come out. They came out before breakfast, no food, and they got shoulder deep in the river because Hannibal lured them across to the deepest point. Heart stopping cold, they get out, their clothes are freezing and solid on them. All their joints and their clothes freeze up. They have to break the ice. They can hardly raise their arms. Hannibal came down, swept down, and killed 15,000. And the elephants trampled the board the rest. Used nature's weapon. Did the same thing at Trossy Men in the fog. That's Trossy Men. He hit his men in the fog the next year. The Romans couldn't see them. He lured them in and then swept down on them out of the fog and butchered them. Another 15,000 men captured, another 15,000 slaughtered. Hannibal's collecting Roman armor, by the way. Next time he does this, that's now the stream where this happened, called the Sanguinetto. Those Italophiles here know that means the bloody stream. Next time at Conai, a windstorm from Africa blew sun and dust in the Romans' eyes. He made them face it. His back was to it. He chose the battle site. Here it is at Conai. It's circumscribed. The Romans had twice as many men. There's a river on one side, the hills on the other. They can't outflank him. He chose this site. And then he played a trick on them. He pretended to go forward. He sent his Balearic slingers with slingshots who could easily take down a bird 100 feet away with a slingshot. They, he told them to focus on that guy. Rid, the big red robe under the legionary standard. That's the military commander. That's Emilius Pallas. They took him down. Oh, turned him into a pulp in his face. He was out of commission. And then Hannibal starts pulling back his middle. He pulls back his middle and pulls back his middle. He's got these two armies disguised on the side in Roman armor. And the wind is blowing dust in the Romans' eyes. And he pulls back and pulls back and pulls back and pulls back. His cavalry chases off the Roman cavalry. The Roman general, who's a political appointee, he deserts. You have 29 tribunes, all these Roman senators. Hannibal now brings his cavalry back and closes the box. 
and start squeezing the Romans from all sides. So the only ones fighting are on the outer edge of the Roman line. Horrible for Rome. What happened that day? 55,000 Romans died. This is one of the blades of the Celtiberians. Dave Baker is a Hollywood sword maker. He, sh he can show you how sharp and hard these things are. South Italy went to Rome. 55,000 Romans died. One out of every five Roman adult males. 30 some thousand gallons of blood spilled that day. One, so this was horrible for Rome. More destiny dangerous to the battlefield. Was Hannibal brutal? Well, tough guy. I wouldn't want to eat one grape from those vineyards. Not with all that blood that went there. The flies on that battlefield are still horrific. I think they came and have bred their business. Would I want to face Hannibal in battle? No way. Tricky guy. And an enigma too. And I take way too much time. So fascinating. But I am passionate about this. If you have a question, email me, ehunt at stanford.edu. And if you have more than a question, if you have some interest in joining us, please get in shape. <laughs> <laughs> bring your intellect, bring your intellect, bring your curiosity. And I am so thankful to come. Thank you. We also have a book um, that we have had Dr. Hunt sign that we will be adding to our collection later. So thank you so much. Tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just to leave you with a moment of inspiration, which I mean, Patrick, I don't know if you said at the beginning how uh, we met, but um, if you are interested in this sort of thing, the, the, we actually met because um, we met with uh, basically learning never ends. So there was a group of families up near Stanford in the San Francisco Bay Area that actually has something called living room lectures. And so they have basically salons so that like college for grown-ups. Um, and so uh, if, you, if you liked this morning's talk, um, then kind of let us know and we'll do more things like that here at Viewpoint so that we can have more like living room lectures. So thank, thank you, you so much. And teachers, National Graphic wants me to come into your classroom via FaceTime. No. You have questions, I'm yours. Yeah. Yeah, Bring me to the classroom, okay? And I, I span a fair, fair uh, range of subjects, from science to history. Great. So I love to come to classroom by a baseball. Please. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.